Welcome to another Enough Already podcast and joining us today, the head of the Tony Katz Media Empire. You can catch his morning show on WIBC in Indianapolis, and he's also host of Tony Katz Today. It's a nationally syndicated radio show and Eat, Drink, Smoke podcast that I produce and am a regular on. It's all about you. It's just all about you. It should don't, be. Don't all worry about me. what Tony's doing. Have you seen what I produced today? <laughs> oh, ladies, I'm a producer. Yeah. How many Fox News hits did you do today, Fingers? Uh, yeah, good question. Good question indeed. Uh, one time I did some hits around a TV that had Fox News on. Does that oh. count? That doesn't uh, count. Honestly, I, I, honestly, until you get paid, I, I don't think any of it counts. <laughs> Absolutely, positively, none of it. That's What's up? true. Another, well, you know, we bring up eat, drink, smoke there at the end, and you know, <sighs> cigar smoking. It seemed like there was this big wave of cigar smoking. Like it exploded in the '90s. There were cigar bars open everywhere, and then. Uh, you know, it kind of petered out a little bit. And then all of a sudden now there's like this big explosion. I, I hear some people talk about how this is like the microbrewery age of cigars because you have these smaller cigar companies that are making great cigars. Uh, what drew you to, to cigar smoking? Because this is a big part of your life. And I mean, you, you have a podcast that revolves around cigar smoking. What drew you to cigars? Yeah, well, uh, certainly I love the podcast. I adore the podcast, and I'm a, I'm a fan of, of of cigars. I I don't know if it's a, a, a rebirth of micro cigars. I I don't I don't know if I would if I would say that. I certainly think that there's a lot of interesting cigar work going on out there. I think that what we've seen is an expansion in more countries. The things you're seeing out of Honduras, uh, for example, is 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 pretty great. The the further growth of Nicaragua, specifically Esteli, uh, in, in cigars has been a wonderful. Now and then, and then there's the the absolute brutal attack on cigars from the FDA because what the FDA wants to do is regulate you down uh, to size. So uh, cigars have different lengths and different with it's known as, as ring gauge, right? So how thick a cigar is around. And what they want to do is say for every different cigar size, you need to engage an application. Well, it's a government application. It takes lawyers, it takes thousands of hours. It's, it's madness. Uh, and so it prevents cigar manufacturers from really expanding lines. The blend can be the same, right? The, the wrapper, the binder, the filler of the cigar, the tobaccos that they use they're in, regardless of where they get them. But they want to attack uh, the actual sizes. So you've got cigar manufacturers like, well, I can't, I can't stay in business. I can't create new, new things. So that's that's a fight uh, that that's been going on for a while. And the FDA is simply wrong. And more senators need to uh, get in uh, to that fight. Premium cigars are not Swisher Sweets. Fingers, Malloy. <laughs> Just want to make sure we're fully uh, aware of that. Uh, but I, I love the art, right? The art of cigars. What it takes to roll a cigar. What it takes to to kind of make that come together, that's special as hell. This is uh, this is not factory stuff. There's one factory, the J.C. Newman people, down there in Tampa, and it's cool as could be how old school that it is. Cigars are, are mom and pop businesses all across the country. Cigars are done uh, with a lot of third world nations, and so uh, this developing nation opportunity that it provides and the jobs that it provides, and most importantly, these, ro these uh, blenders are artisans and these rollers are as well. You try rolling a cigar. Let's see how well you do on the first thousand that you then waste. <laughs> so I, I, lo I love the farming aspect of it. I love the art aspect of it. I love the trade aspect of it. And then, uh, as, as you know, Fingers, we do the Eat, Drink, Smoke podcast. Man, I, uh, cigars are relaxation. Cigars are, are a moment of cool down as opposed to ramp up. And I adore that. Well, I guess the next question I want to ask you, and we can get off of the, the cigar topic, is, uh, you know, the Castro regime, it, it's been evil. Should, should Americans be able to buy Cuban cigars? Ooh, um, the question of should, meaning government, versus the question of should, meaning should you. Uh, I would first start with the, the, the general preface that I give, and certainly there are people with much more cigar expertise than me, uh, I don't believe you need to smoke a Cuban cigar to smoke a good cigar. I think those days are long since over. The seed has been has been spread, uh, honestly, like it was Wilt Chamberlain, and it's it's everywhere and it's good and and you're growing great tobacco in a lot of places. There are still some things that are Cuban made that are 
extraordinary. Uh, the Cohiba Bahike, B-E-H-I-K-E, supposed to be the best cigar in the world. I'm telling you right now, if I got my hands on one, I would smoke one. Uh, but do I think that you should buy Cuban cigars? No, I don't. I don't think you should buy Chinese cigars either, by the way. Um, there are places uh, to buy cigars from. There are lots of places, whether it's the Dominican or whether it's Esteli, whether it's Honduras, um, uh, et, et cetera, things coming out of the U.S. Uh, that are valuable and good and worthwhile and worthy of your attention. So um, if the government wants to try and ease up on the uh, the boycott, the, the sanctions of Cuba, I think that they're wrong. Cuba should know by now that what they have doesn't work, and they should change that. Uh, that said, I'm not going to lecture anybody who smokes a Cuban cigar. Well, let's let's turn our focus a little bit to uh, current events here. You, you're in part of a project called uh, Hoosiers Helping Heroes. It's a great project where you're getting food to healthcare workers at hospitals. Uh, what are you hearing from them? Are they still feeling like hospitals? You're in central Indiana. Are they, are they, are they overwhelmed? Are ICU units uh, packed? What are people telling you? Uh, most of the hospital workers are just thankful that everything with you has cleared up and the rash is gone. Well, thank God for penicillin. You know? That's like wake up um, every day. Saying. They'll tell you two things, that things were really bad. And as of the, this last drop we did, this past week, you know, we got businesses together and they're donating food and everything. We're doing these weekly drops. It's been, it's been incredible. It's been great. Um, things have slowed up a little bit. You talk to people. There is a doctor in Indianapolis named Louis Perfetta, an ER doctor who is uh, one of LinkedIn's 12 doctors to listen to. Uh, right. And, he, and he's right in, in our backyard. Uh, and he will tell you that um, a lot of trepidation going into this. But as we are now seeing where a lot of uh, America has picked up the slack. A lot of what has been learned so they can handle future things. For so many doctors, they've never seen a pandemic before. They've seen trauma before. There was a trauma hospital in downtown Indianapolis called Eskenazi. And one of the things they said to me was, we're used to trauma. We have seen trauma before in huge ways. There was a, uh, at the Indiana State Fair, there was a concert, one of the stage, stages collapsed a few years ago. And that was that they used as their example. A lot of people were injured, people died, it was horrific. It was this huge slam at once and everything was hectic, but they knew there was an endpoint. With coronavirus, they don't know necessarily when that endpoint is because people are still coming in, people are still getting sick. Uh, but what you see is that they've learned better how to deal with sick patients, right? We talk about uh, ventilators and how everybody needed a ventilator. And there was Governor Andrew Cuomo screaming about the need for ventilators. Now they're giving away ventilators because ventilators weren't the answer. 88% of the patients in New York, they put on ventilators, died 50% nationwide. No, they learned that anticoagulants might be uh, beneficial. The jury is still out on hydroxychloroquine. There's a lot of faith in what remdesivir from Gilead Sciences might be able to put together. The Israelis think that they've got a vaccine in the works. Pfizer says come the fall, they'll have a, a, a vaccine uh, for emergency cases in the works. So there's been a lot of private science that has gone aggressive and quick and really incredible. I don't think government response was perfect by any stretch of the imagination. CDC failed. You have been following it as well as I have. FDA absolutely failed in putting all of their eggs into that CDC basket. I see Tracy shaking her head. Yes, they put all their eggs into one basket in terms of testing, and that's where the whole month of February and into March kind of, kind of went. Now, testing isn't even a, a panacea, but if you want to engage testing early, you, trusting the CDC and the FDA to do it didn't work, and that needs to be addressed. I think rational people, regardless of politics, uh, can, can address that. But the nurses, the hospital staffs, the doctors are saying that they've, they've learned a lot. They're much more prepared now. Things have slowed down a, a touch. But what they saw, they saw people dying. They saw people go from, hey, I'm not feeling great, to dead in a matter of hours. And they couldn't help. And that's the part that I think is going to stick with a lot of them uh, and gets to a lot of them. They saw it happen with such rapidness. Uh, that they were they were stunned and shocked and surprised by it. And then they saw it happen over and over and over again. Um, I think there's a lot of questions about the numbers on coronavirus because we're not engaging the proper comorbidity numbers, right? There's a number of the people who got coronavirus and died. Then there's a number of people who got coronavirus, but they had the underlying issue, a comorbidity, and died. 
What's that comorbidity that at the, at the top? Is it obesity? Is it cancer? Was it some other, something else I can't even think of? What's that? And then we'll know who's really susceptible and who needs to be better on guard if future things happen or really when, because I think we're all going to accept the idea that it's going to be a when, not an if. Right. Well, I can answer some of that question, Tony, about the comorbidities, at least in uh, my state of Pennsylvania. Our, our house is dominated by Republicans, and we have a Democrat you know, governor, and his whole health department has been total lockdown. We're now extended to June the 4th which is just outrageous as far as I'm concerned. But yesterday, uh, two days ago, the Speaker of the House put out a letter saying, hey, we were briefed by the health secretary and this is what she told us. So we had about 3,100, just over, people that have died of it. The average age was 79. Then on top of that, of those, 11.9% had four comorbidities, 22.7. 12%, 22.7, let's just round it up to 23, had three comorbidities. 27.2 had two comorbidities. 22.6 had one, and ele- only 11% had zero. So, so the number 90% one, of the people yeah. had something else going on. Exactly. And they said uh, 61% had hypertension, 54 had heart disease. had diabetes and 30% had chronic pulmonary disease. That's interesting, right? I can send this to you, right? No, I'd love it. I I don't pretend to be a doctor, but what that connectivity is, that's the thing that's going to matter more than anything. We've gotten ourselves very wrapped up in the idea that look at the number of cases we have, look at the number of deaths we have. And not asking ourselves where they come from. If you test more people, you'll have more cases. We have 1.2 million cases as of this right now. And that only proves one thing. China lies. It's the only thing our 1.2 million cases even begin to prove. But those comorbidity numbers that you're going through, I mean, that's the story. That's the story that I think rational people, right, uh, are need to be addressing because it tells us so much about what it is we've experienced. Right. And the other thing that was in this is that 67.9, so let's round up to 68, of the deaths happened in either a nursing home, a personal care home, or an assisted living residence. Now so those that... people are technically locked down, right? Mm-hmm. How is that happening? Yeah, oh, they are. Governor Andrew Cuomo, go back to him in New York, said 66% of the people who are coming in now with coronavirus are in lockdown. So what's happening? Well, what's happening is it's been spread through much faster and much sooner uh, than we thought. It is certainly, uh, there's a lot more to learn about it than we thought. These people who went right to lockdown, they have no more science than you, me, and we. Uh, right. What they did is they were just more willing to sit at home, wear their government-appointed gray garb, and await further instruction <laughs> than you and me. There, there's the fundamental uh, difference. Um but if if we're seeing the amount of people who got coronavirus and they're involved in lockdowns, that nursing home conversation is the everything. Because how we have handled nursing homes, we all just have to admit, is wrong. Governor Cuomo not allowing nursing homes to say, sorry, we can't take you. Governor Cuomo not allowing nursing home patients with coronavirus to go to the Jacob Javits Field Hospital, not allowing them to go on the U.S. Naval Ship Comfort. That led to deaths. In Indiana, we have seen both the governor, uh, Eric Holcomb, who I'm not happy with his plan. I'm not specifically mad at him as a person. I think his plan of phased opening is a miserable plan, not based on science and not based on liberty. Uh, The state health commissioner here, state health director, Christina Box, um, they have been dodgy and cagey on the nursing home subject. And part of it is, is that nobody wants the lawsuit. I think that's really what we're seeing. Well, Nobody wants to see this many deaths. The veterans' homes in Massachusetts, where 70, 80 people uh, in, in basically days uh, were killed, man, we need to go over all of that data. And we're going to have to change how we handle nursing homes going forward because the baby boomers are now in them. And they're going to be in these uh, uh, senior kind of lifestyle kind of places. And there's going to be just more of these opportunities as we go forward the next 30 years. And we need to have a better system. We know the Cuomo system didn't do us any damn good whatsoever. Right. Well, I kind of think we, we can't even expect, why do we expect the people that can't keep drugs out of prisons to keep coronavirus out of a nursing home? Why would anybody think you could keep coronavirus out of anywhere? That's the... <laughs> 
<laughs> like, like is it, I, I, I wrote about this, uh, and you can find it at TonyCats.com. It's, it's the Two Americas conversation, right? That goes back to John Edwards. When he was running for president in 2004, he ended up being Kerry's uh, running mate. And John Edwards is a really disgusting guy. Uh, disgusting, yeah. disgusting cat. But he would talk about Two Americas that, back then, and I didn't, I didn't buy in. I, I didn't believe him uh, what, whatsoever, because his was a haves and a have-nots kind of conversation. Looking at America over the last few years, there's definitely a Two Americas conversation, right? You have the America that said Brett Kavanaugh was guilty and not. You had uh, the America that said Trump is guilty of collusion and not. None of those things based on data. Remember, there's more to support Tara Reid's conversation about Joe Biden than there ever was to support Christine Blasey Ford's conversation about Justice uh, Brett Kavanaugh. And now we have this conversation about whether or not we should be open. It's the it, two Americas. There's the Liberty America, and then there, uh, there's the uh, you're going to kill my grandpa because you're just greedy and yearning for a haircut America. Uh, that, that's a weird, weird spot to be in, if only because one has value, the Liberty conversation, and one is completely and totally manufactured. It's a manufactured conversation to say, you just want to have a haircut. No, no, no. The person who cuts hair and gets paid and uses that money to feed their kids, they want to give haircuts. If I also want a haircut, well, then it's a win-win. Opening up society means people have options. It doesn't mean people are going to then run out and engage in that society. We're lost on this. We think this is an all or nothing, or at least media pushes a narrative that's an all or nothing proposition. It's not an all or nothing proposition. There's real science to go through about the comorbidities. There's real lessons to learn about people who are elderly. And then there's this idea of narrative that somehow if you want to open society, you're a killer. It's not true. It's ugly as sin and it needs to get fought. And it's unfortunate that the only way to do it is to fight it, but that's all there is because there are these two Americas and whether it's down political lines, if we want to call it that way, because there is a political side to this unquestionably, it's ugly and it's, and it's dirty. And the people who say you want to open because you're greedy, there's no such thing as greed, Never mind uh, that. It is just ugly as sin that people push down uh, that road. It doesn't help anybody. It's a lie and they should be ashamed of themselves. Well, the other thing too is I, I think that Americans are really pissed off because they want to believe that there's some sort of plan. At the beginning of all this, it... It sounded reasonable, even if uh, uh, some of us didn't like it, the idea that, okay, we need to shut things down for a couple of weeks to let healthcare workers, let hospitals get the proper ventilators, they, the, the PPE that they need, that the ICUs won't be overwhelmed. It sounded like, okay, that sounds reasonable and that sounds like a plan. Now what we're having is it feels like a lot of governors are just spitballing. And just, you know, just coming up with, uh, oh, let, let's see, like in, in one state, we could have uh, bars that serve food can open now. But if you're a bar that doesn't serve food, well, you have to wait another week to right. open. And a lot of the American people are like, oh, what, what the hell is this? Do you actually know what you're doing? And the answer, this is science. You know, this is a plan based on science if the science was taught by Bill Nye. This isn't, <laughs> this isn't science. And we get it. We know that they're full of it. We know that these phased in approaches are nonsense. If you can have in the state of Indiana, a restaurant open at 50% capacity, right? So let's say the restaurant's a small cafe, it serves 25 people. Well, now you can only have 12 people in your cafe, but you're allowed to have gatherings of 25 people. So I'm allowed to get together with 25 people, but if we do it in a restaurant, I can only have 12 people. And then if you take a restaurant and say it's 50%, amusement parks can open at 50%. Well, there's a place down in Southern Indiana called Holiday World. It's actually in Santa Claus, Indiana. True story. It used to be Santa Claus World, and now it's Holiday World. It's great, and they have an exceptionally good water park for kids. Absolutely fantastic. Adults can enjoy it, too. Absolutely terrific. Well, 50% of that water park, where they're actually floating in the Petri dish, is way different than the 50% at the local cafe. So how in the world is any of it science? No, they don't know what they're doing. Now, to your point about, okay, we could see closing it down to try and figure out what was going on. I'm still bothered by it, but I think you're right that most Americans accepted it. Like they were willing to say, okay, we don't know what this is. Let's take a breath. Okay, let's pull kids out of school. I, I still don't think that it was the right move because we haven't proved that lockdowns save lives. 
We can engage conversations that social distancing can save lives. We can make an argument about masks. There's science involved there. Although you talk about nurses, one of the things they tell me, people wear masks inappropriately. They're always fidgeting with them, so their hands are on their face. They don't put it over their nose. It's just, it's ridiculous what, what they're seeing. Uh, but we haven't proven that the lockdown has saved a life, as we have seen. What we have proven is that governors like Tom Wolf in Pennsylvania, governors like Eric Holcomb in Indiana, uh, governors like Tony Evers uh, there in Wisconsin, they don't know. They don't have a plan. J.B. Pritz Pritzker in Illinois. That said, you have Governor, I think it's Ramono in, in, uh, in Rhode Island. I always forget, or is it Raimondo? how to pronounce her name. And then you have Governor Sisolak in Nevada who both said, okay, we're opening up this weekend. We're getting started. So you have people trying it at least, and they're Democrats and they're Republicans. Governor Polis in Colorado uh, is, is opening. Funny, the Democrats don't get abuse, but the Republicans are considered the worst in the world, like Ron DeSantis uh, yeah. in, in, in Florida. But no, it's not based on a plan. It's based on a, this sounds good. This seems right. Let's do this. Uh, that a fat drunk and stupid is no way to go through life. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'd almost just like one of them to admit that we have no idea. Just say we don't really know. The best we can say is this. This is what we think you can protect yourself. But obviously sheltering place isn't working if 60% of the new cases in New York are people that haven't left their apartment buildings. It, it, well, I mean, this is, this is where I think the three of us uh, so, so very much connect. And I think this is a very new thing for a lot of the country. Government can't save you. Government yeah. can't save you. You know, uh, the, the Liberty Society is the only way, the, the Liberty Society cannot guarantee security. And there's absolutely no security without the Liberty Society. These are the facts and they can't be denied. The authoritarian government is easy to do, right? It'd be easy to lock everybody down, easy to put the boot uh, on the neck. That's why there's so many authoritarian governments out there. Liberty is hard, man. Liberty is difficult, difficult stuff. It would be great if they said, look, we don't know. Look, government can't keep you safe. That's not what government does. It provides for the common defense, but it promotes the general welfare. And there's a big difference. If we thought a standing army, what was necessary to kill coronavirus, that bitch would be dead. But that is not <laughs> the thing. So all we can do is tell you, here's what we know. Here's what we think you should do. You got to make choices for yourself. That, that, and somehow that's, that's seen as uh, an abdication of responsibility. I think that is, as you're talking about, Tracy, that is responsibility. Just be clear and direct and focused. It's all you got to do. And no, they, they don't do it. They don't do it enough because I think it will make them look like they can't get reelected. Um, your reelection means nothing compared to A, people's lives, A, people's liberty and B, people's lives, or A, people's lives and B, people's liberty. You know, uh, put that as you choose. You need life to have liberty. Well, just so much of this feels like pandemic prevention theater. I mean, you go back to the mask stuff. I was watching this uh, YouTuber that I've brought up before. His name is Brian Christopher. He's a, a slot machine channel guy, and they have been on lockdown like everyone else. They, they can't provide people content on YouTube from slot, uh, casinos. He went up to Idaho. Idaho uh, casinos have reopened. Uh, there was one uh, Native American reservation where this casino is located, where they have zero confirmed cases in the county and on the reservation of COVID-19. So they said, hey, we're opening back up, but everyone has to wear a mask. So you're seeing people in the shot and he's telling people, hey, listen, they're still allowing you to smoke and uh, you can <laughs> you can drink. You just got to pull up your mask like this. And he does everything wrong <laughs> that you do when it comes to masks. He's got his hand in the middle of his mask and he's pulling it up and he's taking a drink and putting it back down. I'm sure healthcare uh, officials are looking at that cringing. Uh, but it, it's, it's somehow when you're manda mandating a bunch of people to wear a mask who don't know how to wear the mask and maintain it, it's still making people feel better. So I guess that something uh, and, and some people aren't going to wear the mask and uh some people don't care if they're wearing the mask right uh making people feel better is is fine right i but i think that's a private sector conversation right. uh the job of government never mind keeping it small that's our that's our job uh is to say here's what we know here's what we don't know and uh then of course go after china like we're supposed to 
Uh, it, you could argue American response all you want, and that can you could change your vote in an election, do all those things. I don't disagree with any of that kind of stuff, but you got to recognize actual enemies, where they exist, and the lies uh, that were told uh, again and again and again and again. Um, but if somebody wants to, you know, say you have to wear masks, it's like people were upset with, I think, Costco, because they now have a mandatory mask policy. It's their business. They can do whatever they want. Don't go to Costco. It's not a violation of your rights to, for them to say you have to wear a mask. They also said you have to wear pants. Can I help you? Yeah. It's just- shoes, it's, No shirt, no shoes, no service. <laughs> I, I don't understand how uh, them telling me I have to wear a mask is a, an attack or an infringement on my liberty. I don't know how it works in a bank. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but, well, but, uh, the, Jim Hoff posted that picture the other day of him going into a bank and he had a bandana tied around his, <laughs> his face, a red one. He's like, the cashier didn't look too thrilled to see me, but I was just- <laughs> Abiding by the rules. Everyone's gonna have to figure it out. And and the worst part is like there's there seems to be no recognition that this is all gonna happen culturally. It's not gonna happen overnight. They look to government to solve the problem in a broadband kind of way, right? Snap the fingers, Netflix has downloaded your movie. That's not the way culture works. Culture developed over a millennia. And it's gonna take time. We're gonna try things, we're gonna fail at things, we're gonna get better at things, and we'll figure out possibly a new way on some things. You know, and, and that's just the way it is. But people who think that overnight it's going to be fixed and somehow Tom Wolf, the governor of Pennsylvania, has got the answers, he doesn't. Uh, Cuomo doesn't have uh, the answers. Trump doesn't have the answers. Society answers these questions, and it takes time. So, okay, let's, let's get to answering them. I just wonder how much longer people are going to put up with this. So in Pennsylvania, we're opening the western part of Pennsylvania, opened officially at 12.01 a.m. today. But the ah. eastern part is closed until June the 4th. And New York, I don't know if they're opening county by county, like here or what. But Have, have they put up any barbed wire to keep the people from the east <laughs> trying to get to the west? Well, you're only supposed to travel if it's completely necessary. Right. So I would love to get pulled over and asked to see my papers and where I'm going. And, you know, but I, I just wonder with states split like this, how unrest is just going to start bubbling up. Like we you, look at everything as a TV show and this TV show is getting boring and you can tell because now we've got news stories other than the coronavirus popping up. Yes. Yo, which is how you know uh, America has moved past it because there are more political stories out there. The Michael Flynn stories, uh, the Adam Schiff is, is a no good punk uh, story. Jimmy Kimmel is a despicable jerk face uh, uh, story. <laughs> yeah. um, by the way, late night talk is so absolutely disappointing. So unbelievable. The only reason Jimmy Kimmel is not the worst late night host in television history is because Seth Meyers has a late night talk show. <laughs> it's the only reason uh, whatsoever. Um, they, I think they are uh, to a level tired of it, but I think that the maybe the larger point is that they have come to their own conclusions on it. They have come to conclusions, they have seen enough and they understand, okay, this is what this is. And my response is, and now those responses vary. But the idea that your governor or my governor, any governor has more data than you, me, or we is nonsense. They do not. And the, the state health commissioner that they have or, whoever, or whatever title it is, does not actually have more information than you. They have a degree, they have an understanding, absolutely true. But since everybody is parroting everybody else and nobody is coming out to say, what are you nuts? Spray some Windex on it and you're done, <laughs> right? That, that from my Big Fat Creek wedding, um, there is no magical pill. There is nobody who's who's uh, saying, no, no, we have to go a whole new way. They're all kind of mimicking each other. They don't have any more data than you, me, and we. And that's good and smart And that people then get to make their own decisions. And I think when you talk about people who have gotten bored with this television show, they've made decisions. And some of them have said, we will await further instructions. And some of them said, who wants to go out for a beer? And uh, And that's what makes America pretty great. Are you surprised at the amount of Republican governors who seem to have gone lockstep with Democrats with their stay at home orders, especially in states like, I mean, Arizona, which hasn't really been affected compared or impacted compared to other states? Uh, you, you have these Republican governors that are still uh, going along with some of this stuff where a lot of the people on the right are stepping back and saying, well, wait a minute, why are we still doing this? We need to to reopen the country. And it seems like some of the Republican governors have, we kind of dragged them along into 
reopening the country, and reopening their states. Whoever you said that? By that? No, no. Um, uh, remember, uh, all politics are local and their job is to get reelected and they don't want to give any other party, right, the Democratic Party, a way to slip in and say, oh, we could have handled it uh, better. So they go by the get elected conversation versus the liberty conversation, which is something that I object to. I object to that very premise. It has to be the liberty conversation. Doesn't mean you can't be smart. Doesn't mean you can't be safe. Doesn't mean you can't be honest. It means liberty. There, it actually has a meaning. It has a value, and it should it should come come forward and come full. But no, I'm not I'm not surprised by it. I'm uh, not not in any way. I think some of them really didn't know what was happening. Some of them wanted to get a better handle on things. Some of them recognized. Wait a second, that's New York, where a lot of things are happening. I'm not New York. I think that's the Christy Nome South Dakota conversation at play. And some of them got into lockstep because they knew there was no political harm in doing so. They were not going to be politically damaged by locking things down. You were not going to grab pitchforks and walk through the governor's mansion demanding heads on a pike, right? That wasn't going to happen. That's not the way it works. So when there is no, um, there is no stick associated with the carrot, there is no punishment associated with the crime. Um, it didn't hurt them. And if it didn't hurt them politically, uh, they, they say that they see that as a win. So might as well do this because what if they're right? Yeah. Well, now you're hearing word that there was a phone call with former President Obama. Don't care. Some of his people. Don't care. <laughs> Are you surprised that you were not hearing more from from I, the I previous couldn't administration? care less what Barack Obama has to say about anything. He spent eight years running the country and didn't do a single bit of good. I will not listen to him talk about the divided America and the tribalism in America when he uh, fomented it and fostered it. I will not listen to him lecture to me. The answer is no. You had eight years and history will hopefully judge you as poorly as you rightly deserve. Not interested in what he has to say whatsoever. Won't even comment on it. How's that? He says he likes to eat, drink, smoke. No, he didn't. <laughs> no, no, he didn't. If he liked to eat, he'd be more than 17 pounds. If he liked to drink, he'd be more than 17 pounds. And if he liked to smoke, well, then he'd be, uh, you know, better than I thought. Uh, I, I want him to be happy. Be happy in your marriage. Be happy with your kids. Go make your millions of dollars putting out nonsense things on, on Netflix and enjoy your Oceanside home with the rising tides. Don't lecture to me. Not interested. Thank you. I'm surprised he took time away from being outside measuring sea levels to, to even comment on the situation. But you think you think the man measures sea levels? That's I, what he I, does. That's I, what thought, I, I would have thought that's he was why I bought that place. That. I, I, oh, oh, that, oh, I didn't know that. It's an outpost. Yes. I did not know that. I hope he's happy. <laughs> yeah, he got a government grant for it. <laughs> see, see, don't, don't. <laughs> ruin, all, ruin all the fun. All right, Tony, we'll let you get back to what you're doing. Let everyone know once again where everyone can find all of your stuff. Uh, you can find me under Finger Malloy's bed is where. Uh, Tony Katz, T-O-N-Y-K-A-T-Z, TonyKatz.com, Facebook and Instagram, Tony Katz. I'm sorry, Twitter and Instagram, Tony Katz. Facebook, Tony Katz Radio. That's what you do, but TonyKatz.com for everything. And uh, uh, it, it was good uh, to be here, to be amongst uh, the good people. And uh, I think somebody needs to send Tracy some shiplap, and then she will finally fit into the club. Yeah. yeah. That's the plan. Nothing. Tracy? <laughs> No, I would appreciate that. Feel free. <laughs> She's a huge fan of Shiplap. Yeah, yeah I like go. it. I would put more stuff on it, though, but that's okay. What would you put on Tony's wall? He's got a Jack Youngblood jersey back there. Yeah. Well, what would you I put like on my it? wall? Either the American flag or the Gadsden flag. Fingers has got his American flag. If he just leans to his right, you can see it. But he's apparently putting that up outside. Yeah. I should put up, I should put up the American flag? Is, Potentially. Is that... Is that how I prove I'm an American? Is that is that is that how it works? I, if you I, could put well, a, I mean, the football jersey kind of gives it away. The EFL died how long ago? Right. I mean, I, I've I've got stuff. I, I guess I can put up. I don't know. Send me yeah. stuff I can put on my wall. There you go. Probably things you go. that will also sell well on eBay. <laughs> well, you could get some whiskey posters. You know, some nice vintage looking whiskey labels, maybe. Or you see, no. Here's the here's the problem. 
So this is the studio to which I do stuff for for Fox and other TV. Oh. I think if I put, I would put up a full bar. I would absolutely put up a full bar. But then it'd be like, hey, uh, I don't think we could have that on, on Fox and Friends, right? I don't. I, I worry about what that would look like for for them, not for me. For me, I'd right. do it. I just worry about for them. So I should put something else uh, back there. Um, maybe uh, maybe maybe I'll take advertising. It'll be like a whole NASCAR kind of thing yeah, <laughs> call 1900 for dirty political talk something there you go anything i can do that all right thank you tony thank you tony later guys see ya